brunch. We had brunch today. Is she here right now? Melissa? That was good. If I wasn't preaching this afternoon, I would have done some damage. So, I was good, i tell you. Anyway, thank you so much. Whoever's on that team, appreciate it. And uh, I want to thank also the ladies going up to see um, Millie in the hospital. I think that's a great job and a wonderful ministry. Melissa, thank you for your brunch team. That, that was delicious. You're welcome. No, Michael, you have nothing to do with this. It's Melissa. Stop hogging it. No, no, no. Melissa, thank you. Oh, he's got to get the center stage. All right. Uh, but appreciate you going to see Millie on a regular basis. That's, that's great. Ladies, I want to uh, welcome you. I know you're here for the early service. What, what are your names? And where are you from? Uh, again? You came all the way from Haiti today? <laughs> Where do you live? I can't hear, I'm sorry. Oh, Wantor. Well, thank you so much for going out to hear, uh, hear the preaching. It's a blessing to have you. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's look at Romans chapter 2, verse 15 to 16. We're going to preach on. Um, the conscience. And I trust it'd be a help and a blessing to you. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your blessing, and thank you for the morning services on the good ground here. And Father, and Peter spoke about prophecy, and I pray, Father, we would be very careful how we live our lives and make sure we preach holiness and live holiness. And Father, we pray you bless the service this afternoon and have your will in it, and do a great work as only you can. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. And notice chapter 2 of Romans. And we'll look at verse 15 and 16. And the Bible says in verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the means while accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Thank you. you may be seated. Now these two verses are packed, but let me just say this, verse 16, that we're all going to be judged one day, and uh, the Bible says uh, the secrets of men, how? By Jesus Christ. And uh, the second thing is, the Bible says in verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. So the question we have to ask today is, what is the conscience? And it's really interesting when you think about uh, what people, uh, atheists, they'll say, you know, you ask them, where did the conscience come from? And they don't have an answer for it. They're stumped by it. They, well, we don't know. Well, we all have one. Uh, it's one of those things that, um, you know, they uh, say, they, they acknowledge our, our having a conscience, but the thing is this, is they don't know where it came from. It couldn't evolve. So anyway, the conscience is the knowledge of good and evil, which God had put into man. And conscience is a thinking man's uh, filter. So let's take our Bibles. Let's go back to Proverbs 20, Proverbs chapter 20. And uh, we're going to look at a lot of verses here today. And I trust it will be a help. Proverbs chapter 20, and notice verse 27. And the Bible says in verse 27, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. So why is it God looking <laughs> into the belly? Well, the Bible says that, you know, that's where our mind is or our, our heart. 
we have the muscle that is known as the heart, but we have the soul or the heart or the mind which is in the, uh, the stomach area. And uh, God searches it, he tells us, uh, in his word. So then uh, notice Romans chapter 2 and verse 15. Let's go back to our text. Which show the work of the law written in our, their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the means while ex accusing or else excusing one another. So the conscience denotes uh, an abiding consciousness whose nature is to bear witness to the subject regarding his own conduct in a moral sense. So let me give you a few more definitions. We'll talk about this. The Oxford Dictionary says that the conscience is the inward knowledge of the faculty that passes judgment on the moral quality of action or individualism. Another dictionary says the moral sense of conscience within oneself that determines whether an action is right or wrong, good and bad. The conscience, according, is the awareness in his relationship to man has himself uh, in, a, in relationship to God manifesting itself in the form of a testimony that is a result of the action of the spirit in the heart. So the conscience is something that is inborn, something universal. Everyone has one. But because of what the Bible says, there are lots of things that we can do to hurt our conscience or to have a pure conscience. And that's very important. So uh, the conscience is, uh, again, uh, inborn or universal rather than an acquired faculty. The conscience must be cleansed by the blood of Christ. Uh, let's go to Hebrews 9, verse 14. Hebrews 9, verse 14. And also, um, we'll look at chapter 12 in just a moment. But 9, 14, the Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then notice chapter 12 and uh, verse 22. The Bible says, uh, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to, that's not the verse I want, let me see. I'm sorry, I, I don't have the right verse. But I meant well. I get an A for that, right? Anyway, um, the idea is the, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 14, every person must have this spiritual birth that we have to be born again. And it's very important if you're gonna, uh, if you think you're gonna go to heaven. So the conscience is an eternal judge examining what all I do and say. So we can have a guilty conscience. How many experienced that before? Right? Everyone, if you're alive, you, you have. We can have a, a defiled conscience. We can have an impure conscience. We can have a very good conscience. The Bible speaks of that. And so these are important things we have to understand what the Bible says. So, but a conscience, it, Jimmy Cricket had it wrong. A conscience is not to be your guide. A lot of people, you know, and they like Pinocchio and the conscience, but that's based on the Bible. We, we're going to trust the Bible to guide us, direct us, and lead us, to help us, to give us comfort, etc. But uh, we shouldn't do it for the, with the conscience. So, let's look. First of all, we see an evil conscience. Not all conscience are good. In fact, uh, since the fall, they're depraved. And notice Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18, please. Ephesians 4 and verse 18. And the Bible says in verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So man is uh, in, in a lost condition, uh, he's depraved. 
He's without God, without hope, and without Christ. So uh, the Ephesians 4.18 describes the unconverted man having the understanding, uh, you know, uh, darkened. And Romans chapter 1, let's take a peek at that. And Romans 1 and verse, um, let me see, uh, verse, verse 18. So bear with me, please. For the wrath of God is revealed uh, from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So these people who know the truth, they hold on to it, but they, they do it in unrighteousness. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even these eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the man by nature is without excuse, because there are things that God had put in creation that he's going to reveal to man. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And in verse 22, professed themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. So instead of glorifying God for who he is, they turn God into corruptible man, birds, four-footed beast, etc. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts, to the son of their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affection. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use to the woman, burn their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly or shameful, as the Bible, say, as the Bible says, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. Now think of that. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, uh, whispers, backbites, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who know in the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. So Paul lays out for us the Gentile world and uh, speaks about how they're depraved, and what they think of God and how they go about their lives. And it's really tragic. You think about this. Three times God gives them up and then finally says he gives them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind is when you're in a condition that is impossible for you to respond to God. Impossible. And that's something that you don't want. You want to stay far away from that as possible. And here we have some, some uh, ideas where the God says they give them up to what? Because their heart, they're so depraved, they're so evil, they're so wicked, and God gives them over to a reprobate mind. Now, notice if you would, Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, and notice if you would, verse 15, Titus 1, verse 15. Now, Paul says, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled, unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Now these people, and they were Cretans, they were, uh, they were given over to uh, re religious, uh, religiosity. They, they gave themselves over to work, salvation. And he mentioned that in the next verse, verse 
16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and have every good work reprobate. So these people were trying to work their way to heaven. And God said that's a way to have your conscience defiled. So uh, he, they, they, he says in verse 15, unto the pure, all things are pure. But un, unto them that are defiled, unbelieving, is nothing pure. He, but even their, con, their mind and conscience is defiled. So this is another thought here about, you know, having our lives and such a way that we can be so uh, defiled and found uh, impure in our thought life and in our actions. So you, you may think sometimes, how do people get to that place where they, they do this, you know, this vile or whatever we want to say it, impure actions? Well, they defile their conscience. And I'm going to show you how they do it in just a few minutes. It's so, it's so in our face, and yet it's so wrong. And uh, it's, so we have to be careful not to hinder our conscience. We have to be careful. You say, well, I'm older now, and so on. We have to finish the course. We have to run the race, finish it. So, you know, it can be at any time that we can make our minds impure or defiled against God. Now, what we should be praying is found in Hebrews chapter 10, please. Let's turn there. Hebrews chapter 10. And notice verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast of profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. So God tells us in verse 22, uh, a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. So this is speaking about, you know, uh, again, a, a true heart uh, about salvation. He mentioned in verse 23, let's hold on to our profession that, you know, would be faithful uh, to God and not waver. So God, God in, in tells us how important it is uh, for the, the heart, the mind, and the conscience to be on the same page. So second of all, we see a convicted conscience. And it go, we go back to Romans chapter 2, verse 15. I'm not going to read it. This is the work of the conscience of man. The judgment of conscience is categorically without giving reason. It is absolute, for it's neither bargains nor compromises, and is definitely individualistic. And this is a picture of the conscience in action. So we have a convicted conscience. And uh, w why? Because of things we've done. And again, we realize it's not our hearts, but when we have guilty conscience or convicted consciences, we, we are realize we've done something wrong and we've got to make things right. And then number three, a purged conscience. So let's go back to Hebrews 9, 14, please. Hebrews 9, 14. And the Bible says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit off himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So God tells us here uh, a purged conscience. And what, how, what does it have to do? It has to do with the blood of Christ. And uh, the, the blood that we receive at the moment of salvation uh, is, is uh, so important for the cleansing so notice he says here in uh, chapter 9, verse 14, he says, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So God says in 1 Thessalonians uh, not, uh, 1, verse 9, how you turn to God uh, from your, your idols to what? To serve the true and living God. So there's something we said about repentance, Somebody said about the blood being applied to our lives uh, as a result of coming to Christ. And again, he speaks here in chapter 9 and verse 14, we purge our conscience from dead works 
And that's what Paul was referring to in Titus chapter 2, these dead works, you know, the, the, they're, they're reprobate. Uh, they're, they're not acceptable before God. Why? Because it's done uh, in uh, the idea that uh, they're doing these things, but it's not acceptable before God. And so the Christian who are trying to work their way to heaven, again, Paul mentions uh, the uh, blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, to what? To purge your conscience from dead works that serve the living God. So again, we, we understand about the purged conscience. And uh, again, the, uh, the conscience is converted as a result of what God did for us. So let's go a little further with this. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we see the, a pure conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And notice verse 9, please. And the Bible says in verse 9, uh, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So Paul speaks here about a pure conscience. Uh, notice he mentions 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And uh, notice, if you would, uh, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 3. And he says, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with what? I, I'm sorry. A pure conscience. That without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So Paul was writing to Timothy, who was the pastor of Ephesus, and he was saying that you, you've been saved and you have a pure conscience. Now notice Proverbs chapter 1, please. Proverbs chapter 1. This is so important, beloved. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. The Bible says, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So I, I want you to think with me uh, of all the universities we have just in our country. I think of not all, all the university, all the colleges, all the letters that follow people's names. And unless they fear the Lord, notice what God says here in verse Second part of the verse, he says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if you don't even fear God, I mean, the Bible says you're a fool. It's so important that we have a fear of God and be, be willing to submit ourselves, yield ourselves, surrender ourselves to recognize who God is. Very important. And when you think about a pure conscience, think about all these people in our world, you know, who are prof prof professing wisdom and knowledge, and God calls them fools. So at conversion, not only the soul saved, but also, also the conscience. The unconverted feel the conscience is a burden. He said, why do I feel guilty of this? I don't want to feel guilty, and so on. So whereas uh, to the say the conscience is a help, you know, think about that, that how much the conscience is a help to us. There's things that we can get involved with that also we realize this is not right. I shouldn't be involved with this. I'm going to, you know, not do this anymore. I'm not going to look at this. I'm not going to watch this. I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to listen, and so on. Whereas young people and adults can defile their conscience. Again, let's look at Titus chapter 1, please. Titus chapter 1. And notice verse 15. So Titus 1 in, in verse 15, the Bible says... Um, Unto the pure, all things are pure. Unto them that are defiled, unbelieving, is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So let's talk about late night comedians. Let's talk about people who there's nothing that they can't joke about. 
And uh, there should be restraint when we talk about joking or fooling around. We shouldn't talk about certain things. We should never talk about God. Amen. Never talk about something personal. I mean, these things are wrong. And, um, but here they, there's nothing that is, is pure to them. They can just talk about anything in their lives. And uh, that's what it is. So think about a man who comes along and he's going to start uh, maybe fill his mind up with the wrong music. And let me just be very careful when I say this. The wrong music is rock and roll. It's country western. western. It's hip hop. It's uh, you name it, it's wrong. If it's of the world, it's wrong. And you can justify it. You can talk about it. You know, I'm, you know, whatever your thing is, it's not Christian. It's not Christian. So can people defile themselves? Of course you can. Why? Because it's not Christian. And it, it, you wind up listening to it to a place where it's going to destroy you. And maybe it give me an impure mind. I'm not saying maybe. I should say it's going to give me an impure mind. Maybe it's um, watching a TV series. And uh, it's not good. And uh, you know, there's so many channels. I, I didn't know how to. When I, when I leave regular channels, I, I go into, like, what's an acorn? What's a. I can't even. I don't even know what they are. It's just everything and anything's available. But you may get yourself into fixes that can cause your mind to be impure. It can defile your heart and mind. Think about uh, young people who get involved in pornography or a man or a woman who get involved with pornography. It can destroy them. I mean, it can destroy you can wind up losing the right understanding of what God tells you that is important and, and so on. And maybe it's defiling yourself by trying to attain forgiveness by doing the same thing in an act of self-righteousness. So these are areas that we can really harm ourselves. And so let me give you a couple of stories you know, I, I, I knew a, a, a young man who got himself involved with pornography, and he wound up defiling his, his mind to a place where he said to himself, you know, if I continue going to church and trying to believe that, the Bible, and then continue on with pornography, then I have to give an account for my pornography. So what I'm going to do is I'm not, I'm not going to believe in God. I'm going to be an atheist, and I'm not going to, and that's what took place, and destroyed his soul. So the idea is that, you know, you can think I, I can be involved with this, but it's going to take God to get you out of it. That's a fact. It's like the, the story I heard of a young man who, down in West Virginia, and uh, he told his mother about what, what he was doing, and he'd been going out on weekends, and, and uh, he was defiling himself with, you know, the whole thing of drugs and, and booze and, and uh, you know, so on. And so his mother said, you know, if you cannot continue to do this. It's going to uh, give you, you're going to have a real strong effect by this. It's going to affect your life. And he, he said this. He said, but I can try. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, there's certain laws that God has established in our lives. And you can't transgress against them. You know, if you go and sin willfully and do whatever you want to do, it's, you may do that, but it's going to take God to get you out of it. And that's so important to understand that it's going to take God. And so, you know, you can say, uh, you know, I don't believe in God and so on. But that's, that's denying what is a known fact. God wrote these things on your heart, your mind, your soul. That's your conscience. And you get to a place where you defile it, a place where it's uh, going to be spiritually 
uh, ineffective in your life. And so you, you've got to be careful what you, is you get yourself involved with because it's only going to take God to get you out of it. And I say, as we've read early in Romans chapter 1, it may be that God continues to give you up to the place where you become a reprobate. And a reprobate mind, I'll never forget, I told you the story before, we had a, a young man who attended church faithfully for years. And I always questioned the salvation. It was spurious, and, and uh, I, I didn't like things I saw about him. And then finally, he dropped out of church. I went to see him, I think, about two months later. And uh, he told me, he said, uh, I'm, I'm starting to go to another church. I said, what church are you going to? Which I was, you know, fine. You, you want to go to another church? It's your business. We're all going to answer before God. And he told me, he said, I went back to the Catholic church. Well, that tells me, you know, you're not saved. And then he told me that he was addicted to pornography. Now, it's so serious that he showed up at a church years later, a couple of years later. And uh, when I tell you I, I believe he was a reprobate, I preached a very strong message that morning on reprobation. I had no idea who's going to be there. None. And he shows up. I'm thinking maybe I got, maybe I'm, I'm judging this guy too, too harshly. Maybe, you know, but God proved the point to me that I wasn't judging him harshly. I was judging him righteously. And I talked to him after the service, and he acted like, you know, he was right with God. He was doing God's will for his life, and he was so far from the truth, it was pathetic and steeped in pornography. So I'm, I'm warning you today. I warn all of us, myself included. You, you do things that are going to get you involved. You can defile your heart and mind. You can cause yourself great trouble at, at, uh, at this juncture of life, wherever you are, whether you're young or old, or whatever it may be, it's so serious. You may choose your sin, but it'll take God to get you out of it, if God's going to get you out of it. So, all right, let's look at some other verses and we'll close. Let's go to John chapter 8, please. John chapter 8. I don't know what time it is, so don't tell me it's 3 o'clock. All right. John 8 and verse 9, notice the Bible says, um, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and a woman standing uh, in the midst. And what did Jesus say in verse 11? And she said, no Lord, uh, no man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and what? Yeah. So he said, Don't, don't do it again. You need to stop. So th there was a conscience that the people had, which is good. Uh, and then it should be kept pure and void of offenses. Let's go to Acts chapter 23, please. Acts 23, verse 1. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in, in all good conscience before God until this day. And then notice, if you would, chapter 24 and verse 16. And the Bible says, And herein do I exercise myself, uh, myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. And that's where we should live. We should not want to offend God, and we sure we don't want to offend one another. So it's very important that we're careful. And then notice, if you would, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5. And the Bible says in verse 5, Now the end of the commandment is charity of a pure heart and of a good conscience, of faith unfeigned. 
Notice if you would verse 19, the same chapter. Holy faith and a good conscience, uh, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwrecked. And then notice chapter 3, verse 19. Chapter 3, verse 19. And the Bible says uh, in verse... There is no 19. What, what happened? Oh, I have in my Bible. I'll tell you later. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. You know, Liz, I'm telling you, keep doing my notes. I'm going to just take it away from you. Right, number three, um, I thank God whom I served for my forefather with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. And then uh, notice you would um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And notice verse um, 2. Uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, the thought here about a hot iron. So what's he talking about? He's talking about going against the word of God. And um, it renders being unsensitive. Uh, it's um, what we call cauterizing something. You know, there's things that people that sometimes cauterize the nose and so on. Uh, it means to brand, as in cattle. And the Bible says it's with a hot iron. So these are serious things that we need to consider. Again, First Timothy chapter 4, and notice verse 2. Sorry, I flipped from there. Uh, notice he says this. Verse 1, now the Spirit speak expressly that a lot of times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirit doctrine of the devils. Verse 3, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meat, which God has created to receive with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth. So this really is the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, he says that some of the part from the faith, what are they going to do? going to give he to seduce and spirits and doctor devils, uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and have their conscience seared with a hot iron. And that's not what you want. So let me do this. Uh, let me stop here and see if there's any questions about the conscience. I'll, I'll try to answer this again. Any questions at all? Bernie? So is it safe to say that God gives everyone a conscience good conscience, but through our life and through our choices and through our experiences, we can either sear that conscience, we can defile that conscience, and we can actually turn that into like an evil conscience. Sure. <clears throat> exactly. And through our faith in, in Christ and Him cleaning our conscience right. and new again. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's from the brother Christ. Good. Someone else? Anyone else? Tim? Tim, let me say this. I don't know if there's any scripture. I don't think there is. But I can tell you, I, I mean, say 47 years, you know, I've heard that so many times where people say, I didn't think I was going to have another chance. God spoke to me in such a way that I felt I had to respond. If I didn't, I, I'd, I'd be maybe reprobate. But they don't know that, but that's what they said. I've heard it too many times. But praise the Lord. All right. Anyone else? All right, well, let's stand to our feet and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. I pray, Father, we be careful with our conscience. First of all, that we don't defile it, uh, don't allow it to be impure. And, Father, if we have things like this in our lives, help us repent. Help us to turn from us and help us to make, make our conscience pure and right before thee. I pray, Father, people not dismiss this, but 
respond to, to Christ as a result of this. And Lord, we ask you bless this invitation. I pray, Father, you speak to our hearts and have your perfect will both saved and lost. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, heads are bowed and eyes are closed and don't look around. I trust you respond as